Hello everyone, welcome back to Crypto News. We have a quick update for you guys regarding the Heather and Tucci case. Now originally I told you guys that the hearing was going to be on August 4th, 2017 and that is still going to take place. However, on the Friday hearing, Heather will request to move the hearing to August 9th, 2017 since David Boss did not provide her with any paperwork to review for the hearing. And also in this video we're going to go over a quick recorded call with BZ and also Mr. McDonald that actually break down the case, the documents, and everything. Um, I think this is a very valuable piece of information that you guys need to see, and let's get into it right now. Hi, Paul. Hi, BZ. How are you? I'm great. I'm great. We're, <laughs> we're all flying fast. Um, so what I'd like to have the focus and intention of the call for between you and me and for all everybody listening is to just have a kind of a summary, an executive summary, an overview of what's going on and um, ways to look at the actual data that's coming out to see that data in a, in a more expansive light. So when you hear... Um, uh, something that's been stated by President Trump or you're seeing a news article or a video, whatever it is, you'll start to see the dots, as I like to call them, that are connecting. And that will all lead back to the filings, the UCC filings that Heather has done and what is happening right now vis-a-vis -vis the court case. Um, well, it's not even a court case. We'll get to that with Paul. But the case that's um, in front of the district court in Washington, D.C., Right. Okay. So where would you like to begin? Well, I think, <laughs> <laughs> right, it's, it's lots of rabbit holes, and we'll try to keep just on focus to each piece and not go all the rabbit holes. There will be show notes, and the IUV okay. is a whole case of show notes. So why don't you okay. start by telling us what the UCC financing statement just is in a nutshell and why it's so pivotal to this. Okay, so... UCC one financing statement um, is the basis of all the filings and when I say the filings I mean the one people's public trust 1776 filings it depends how much you know about this particular situation but um, it goes back quite a while and um, you know, if you've just if you're new and you've just come to this subject and you've heard about Heather's, Heather's arrest and so on and so forth, um, and you your information is sketchy, uh, it's <clears throat> the word to use. The best word to use is context. You know, um, the more context you have, uh, the better you are able to see what's happening in the wider uh, world, if you like, you know, it doesn't really matter um, what what country or what part of the world it is, you know, uh, things can be seen to be happening, but the particular focus and the, <laughs> the most uh, obvious and in-your-face event that's taking place at the moment is, is, is Heather's situation in Washington DC and whereby she was arrested on the 25th of July by FBI agents I believe but the arrest warrant actually says that it was a US Marshal who arrested her so and we have uh, con we have confirmation of that actually directly from Heather so um, right yeah right so and then you know people can be directed to um, you know, for, for, for the purposes of uh, what's happening, uh, for the purposes of finding out or getting a, a picture of what's actually happening now on the ground, if you like, uh, the, I, you know, the one particular video that I'm aware of is the Crypto News video from Neil Wolf, is it? Is his is, is surname Wolf, is it? Wolf is his surname, yes, but the video, Crypto video is by another person. That's all on the IUV. Okay. So yeah, that right. gives a lot of detail. But it gives a lot of detail about uh, what was happening on the 31st of July at the U.S. District Court, 333 Constitution Avenue, Washington D.C., uh, when 
Heather had been detained at the local, I assume, Washington Metropolitan Police Headquarters originally and detained. And she had to be brought in front, in front of a magistrate uh, on the basis of the, the warrant that did eventually appear was a federal warrant, okay? And federal warrants are governed by the rules, the federal rules of criminal procedure. And you can look that up, and you can look up Rule 4, and you can look up Rule 9, and um, you can get a picture of what that arrest warrant is about, um, or at least how it's, how, uh, the, the rules which govern the issuance of the said warrant, okay? So, yeah? I was just going to say, wanna... I was just going to say that that particular warrant, um, is out there. You'll see one that's out there that has circles all around it. Those are actually Heather and Tucci Giraffe's pencil marks. She's circling it uh, for all the mistakes, all the errors, and all the inaccuracies that are. I haven't actually seen it yet. I was too busy document. looking at it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, and, and what what would uh, go with that then? Um, the warrant itself. Oh yes. Uh, in the warrant, it says it's uh, you have the reason why this warrant has been issued. You see, there are various instances which you can mark, uh, which describe what the reason why this warrant is being issued. Okay, so in this case, it's indictment. Now, there's an indictment. And that indictment is available on the Pacer system. Uh, which more, I, I think anybody can open an account on a patient system. I'm not that familiar with the American system, to be honest. Um, I don't. I haven't been using it, you know, directly every day as as such. But uh, that's important, you know, to know that there's a context there. Okay, so the context is that the, the arrest warrant was issued by uh, the U.S. District Court of the Eastern District of Tennessee. Okay. Uh, ostensibly, on uh, on the face of it, you know, regardless of any <laughs> any uh, any any defects, you know, de or reasons why, or you know, <clears throat> interference or whatever happened in the background <laughs> while that warrant was being issued. Okay. Right. So the, uh, you just you, you just examine it for what it is at face value, you know. And it's obvious that there's an FBI investigation into certain things that happened, which are all detailed in the indictment. Now, the indictment itself, yes, I say it's uh, available on Pacer, but uh, there's a copy of it out there somewhere on the net, which came out fairly rapidly after Heather's arrest. And uh, that gives you an idea um, right, and I'll, of, and I'll, of, of the chart. Yes, Sorry. and I'll publish the one with Heather's circle notes on it. One of the things I do want to um, interject at this moment is that um, when I'm mentioning right now that um, Heather has told me this or told me that, those are or, or told us, um, that's, that's direct uh, uh, physical on the phone um, communications from Heather to either myself individually or myself with other groups of people or other people on her uh, team. So just so that you know that, and um, the notes of those calls, you'll also see in the current um, status post. One of the things, Paul, if you would interject in here, the statement that Heather made that this is now being um, taken as a political case, and how that's changing not only the the atmosphere of what's happening, but what people will see uh, evolving right this minute. Right, okay. I mean, let's take the phrase political case, you know. Uh, that could have a number of contexts. Contexts, okay. Well, context is a great word, and uh, <laughs> context is what Heather talks about context all the time. I mean, it's, uh, you know, you have to have a context of what it is. Now, how she sees it as a political case, I haven't really had a chance to speak to her. Uh, about that, so I can only speculate about really what that actually means, you know. 
but uh, there are elements that make it a political case, if you like. Um, for example, I mean, the fact of the matter is that prior to the hearing on the 31st of July, um, she instructed Hello? Yeah, go ahead, you're fine. Can you hear me? Yeah, you're perfect, keep going. <laughs> you didn't cut me off, it was to stop me from saying no, no. something. No, no, no. <laughs> right, well, let's say she, I happen to know that, you know, she instructed people to, she instructed files, filings to be made. Um, a copy was given to her lawyer, her public defender. And, um, were about what happened after he received them, uh, the filings were given to the clerk of the court, okay, and uh, a stamp was received on the index page as such to indicate that the files at least had been given to the clerk, as you know. Now, there was a bit of an issue raised about that as well, I believe. I haven't verified it, but... Um, you know, that's really ongoing, you know what I mean? It's kind of like I, 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 I wouldn't like to uh, to speculate about, you know, what the position is in relation to that, but certainly filings were made, you know. And the list of the filings is there on your website, is it? Yes, mm -hmm. all up there. Right, okay, so we know the kind of documents that have been filed, okay? And also they've been given, just to interject, they've been given as a public notice, so the IUV is serving as a public notice, and anybody who copies it will copy okay. that public notice right. of those okay. filings being out there as well. Right, okay. So if you look at the if you look at the filings that were entered or given to the clerk, okay, um, uh, most of them are UCC filings. UCC one financing statement and amendments. So if you file an, uh, a UCC fina financing statement, it's known as, an, as uh, I suppose you know the original financing statement, and there are rules and possibilities to amend that financing statement and add collateral to it. Okay, so to understand or to get a picture of what a financing statement is, I can give you um, Conan University's interpretation or at least definition of it. If my page will load, it may not. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm operating on a really uh, slow connection here, but uh, you know, it's a claim against collateral. If you type UCC1 financing, UCC-1 financing statement, into Google and the word Cornell, you find a link to description or definition of what a UCC1 financing statement is. And my interpretation of it is that it's a claim against collateral. See, uh, Uniform Commercial Code is a set of rules, if you like. Um, it's uniform, it's commercial, and it's code. Okay, so. Um, it's a mechanism for dealing with commercial transactions. It's international law and commercial tra transactions or international law and commercial contract worldwide is a, one way I've heard it described in the past. Okay, And I think Heather may well have been the one who told me that. But um, a perfected claim against collateral. So you have to get a an idea of what collateral is, you know, collateral, collateral, what is it? Go to the dictionary and have a look at what definition of collateral is in, in, in various ways. But collateral can take more, can take the form of more than physical, tangible assets, although that, in this case, is quite a lot about what, uh, quite a lot about what it is about, if you like, you know the taking into custody of 
tangible assets. So what I'm hearing you say is that that, that as, <clears throat> as it relates specifically to the UCC1 financing statement that Heather originally filed with the other two trustees mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. the One People's Public Trust 1776 was taking into account and all the all the uh, subsequent documents and collateral documents that information that was filed with it so that all those documents that everybody sees on the links that they'll they can research um, all of those were basically taking every people every one person on the planet the whole planet doesn't matter where you live, where you were born, where you're residing, none of that matters. If you're on the planet and you're a human being, all of you were, were included in the filings, all of your value. So that would be your possessions, but also the value of you yourself, the human being, the live person and the value and the value that you're creating. And on a much grander scale, the intrinsic value of, of you as a eternal essence of um, a being uh, created directly from original from source is that correct to say well let me put it in a slightly different way okay um, let's say that the entire human race or <laughs> human race um, <laughs> you know the physical beings the living beings on the planet over the course of a long, long period of time had been made collateral. They had been turned into collateral mm -hmm. through uh, the use of uh, commercial techniques which had evolved over a long, long period of time. You know, how far do you want to go back? You know, do you want to go back to the, <laughs> the Minas Hay Pirates of Denial, you know, or or um, you know it's like Babylonian That's right. uh, money techniques you know I mean and as Heather has often said that it isn't just the UCC is not just on this planet the UCC was not invented on this planet it comes right. from uh, you know out in the universe it's actually the universe well yeah I oh, haven't uh, looked into that I mean I, ha I have heard things said about that, but um, it strikes me that it's somewhat mathematical in nature and uh, in maths, in mathematics is a big factor in how we discern how the world works or how we have been used to, um, you know, figuring out what um, the world around us, if you like, you know. That's correct. So, yeah, so it's a mathematical of nature, so that would suggest then that it's not confined to this particular uh, planet. We're not even sure if it's a planet anymore, but it's up to you what you <laughs> how you want to look at it. But generally speaking, most people have been under the impression that it's a planet, you know. Right. But anyway, let's not deviate down that little avenue because, <laughs> you know, we're talking about UCC here and this is very practical, you know, this is a very practical matter. I don't know if you've been able to get that link or find that link because it's a very interesting way of, it's actually coming off for me here now, I think. Um, just to read it is, 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 is quite fascinating, you know, because it gives you an idea. Once you know what the definition of a UCC1 financing statement is, it opens it up for you completely and gives you a context of what it is that has been done. And I just say this now because you were talking about the filings that the public trustees had done and how that all came into being. Um, the first filing was made uh, in the year 2000, um, 4th of May 2000, okay? And the man who made it was a guy called Charlie C. Miller, or Charles Miller. Um, that document is very interesting in and of itself. You know, I mean, my experience of court cases and the law and so on and so forth is um, much of the time, if you, want to, if you want to find out exactly what happened, I mean, you have to go back to the beginning, you know. Because if you don't go back to the beginning, you don't have any context of what you're dealing with. You can see only a snippet of it, a snapshot. 
in any particular moment, right? So you have to go back and you have to find out exactly how this thing evolved, you know? Right. And if, if, if you go back to that initial financing statement, uh, it's also described as perpetuity, okay? And the perpetuity in and of itself is a very interesting uh, subject or concept, if you like, okay? Uh, the perpetuity being the perpetual succession of the, cr of the trust of creation is one description that I particularly like. Uh, so, the perpetual succession of the trust of creation, where does that come from? I mean, you, you, certainly you have to go back and read read the perpetuity. It's a UCC1 financing statement. It's an initial financing statement. An initial financing statement. So in other words, it's the first one. So you go back, you have a look, and you read what it says in it. And then, like, to interpret a UCC1 financing statement, uh, is not necessarily that difficult, you know, even if you haven't uh, studied the law or, or you haven't studied the rules and fundamental principles of commerce. Uh, but you do have to look at the form itself, you know. There's a UCC1 financing form which you fill in if you want to file a UCC1 financing statement. And it contains certain elements you know, and those elements of the form are numbered. And two fundamental elements of a, UC, of, a, of, of a UCC1 financing statement are debtor and secure party. Okay? So... So just break those very briefly down. <clears throat> so who would be, well, in this case, with, with Heather and all the one people and then the controllers of the... False matrix. Who would be the debtor and who would be a secured party? Well, there were various debtors during the course of the filings, which happened, you see. And the context comes from the entirety of the filings. Right. The first one, not the last one, not the middle one, but the, the entirety of them. And what came after the UCC1 financing statements or the, or the, or the, the public trust filings, if you like. Yes. Okay. It's, it's what came after that. Which is the IM documents and then the well, factualized trust, right? Well, you know, absolutely. The original due declaration and notice of factualized trust is a specific instant document in relation to the case that's happening in Washington, D.C. today. Okay, so that and there's an original due declaration of issue by original depository as well, which goes with those two documents go together. The first document is one page. The second document's number of pages and it states specifically uh, it, it involves uh, the due cause, if you like, of uh, the first document. Okay, so it, it, it's a the, the first document is a summary, it's a due declaration and notice of a factualized trust, and then the, the second document it goes a lot deeper into the hows and why what that document is, see? Mm -hmm. Now, and all the UCC filings, the relevant UCC filings are referenced in that second document. So when you read it, when you read the, for, the, when you read the factualized trust and the, and the second document that goes with it, everything is there, it points to everything that happened, okay? And it starts out with the perpetuity. The original filing of Charles C. Miller in the year 2000, and uh, the subsequent, all the subsequent filings, one by one, and they're all there referenced. You know. Now, yes, sorry. I just want to um, interject here. So, let's put that aside for a second, and people can do their research. All the documents will be up there. Um, but with yeah, things there's, a, there, there, there's one other thing that I, I just want to point out. Okay which is quite important here. And you mentioned you mentioned it uh, just a minute ago, mm -hmm. and uh, it was it's the term one people, okay? And that term 
comes from the Declaration of Independence 1776 in the first paragraph okay when during the course of human events becomes necessary for one people one people no one people could be anybody right could be one guy <laughs> <laughs> do you know what I mean could be could be a tribe of Yaki Indians <laughs> okay it could be you know the Irish, the French, the Germans, you know, the Canadians, the Eskimos, one people, any people, okay? Any one people, do you care to imagine? You know, so what they're laying down in the Declaration of Independence is a fundamental principle. You know, we take um, certain fundamental principles to be self-evident. That's what they're saying in the document. We, you know, we observe the world around us and this is what we see. Mm -hmm. Okay, these are fun, these are fundamental basic things. Okay, but one people, the context of one people, and to give it a, just a wider view is, is um, you know, the 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 idea that um, when the Declaration of Independence was signed and became known and was made available to other countries or other nations, if you like. It's, you know, countries and nations are two different things, and at least, you know, an element of that there. Um, <clears throat> you know, there's a subject which I haven't really studied very much, uh, it's called the Law of Nations. It's quite interesting, you know, the background is very interesting there. I heard uh, a speech by a guy a little while back, he's um, a Canadian Indian, I believe, and he spoke very well about, uh, about the Law of Nations and how it came to be. So we're going back a long, long time. But however, um, the Declaration of Independence, 1776, I don't think there's any nation which rejected it, okay, as, as uh, unauthorized or, or, or void or, or, you know, nobody disputed it. Right. Okay. Then there's no dispute as to the Declaration of Independence. As far as I'm aware, and I don't believe, uh, I don't think anybody would really, you know, I'm not sure that whether anybody be <laughs> rejects it or not, but um, it didn't seem to have been rejected by any nation formally, let's say. Right. Let's call it that. Okay, and therefore it's accepted that when it becomes necessary, in ju when during the course of human events it becomes necessary for one people to do X, X, and X, or whatever it is. Then they have the authority to do that, you know. So that's where the idea and the background comes for this term known as one people. And we are all one people, whether you like it or not, you know, our collective uh, culture, whether it be on the planet or whether it be on a continent or, or a nation or anywhere else. One way or another, we're a collective all the time, always happy. Absolutely, and as you're seeing evidence right this moment, because it's, this is just not Heather in uh, the the country of of the United States in the court in D.C. This is actually the one people on the whole planet. What is sure. un, what's unraveling and unfolding? Um, when you just said a minute ago, you were talking about the Declaration. You're talking about no one around any country had formally. Um, Rejected. It wasn't. It was. You said rejected. I was going to say rebutted it. So I just want to. That makes me want to come to a question that's very often asked or thought of, if it isn't asked, and that is, well, why did um, you know? How do we know that this was accepted? How do we know all the filings, the One People's Public Trust 1776 filings, and all of the subsequent filings that came after them, which are all correlated and all collated and collected in the factualized trust. Um, so that's an inclusive document of everything, now with the indexes that have been published as well and, and, this, and the stamp from the D.C. court, which is no small matter. That means it's that they're not. in. They're in <laughs> that means that they're it's in. No the, small matter. <laughs> you can say that now again. Okay. Underline exclamation point highlighted in red. Um, <laughs> so with that, just a very quick thing. How when people say, "Well, how do you know that this is so?" and 
and the question uh, or the answer comes up of being unrebutted and yeah. unrebuttable. <laughs> mm -hmm. So if you could just take it very briefly because we want to get to some other things and we're ticking along here in the time. Just give us a sense of what the unrebutted is and the unrebuttable, as, as Heather used to say. Okay, so what you're talking about, what you're talking about there is the fundamental principles of commercial law, okay? And one of the fundamental principles is that an unrebutted affidavit is the judgment in commerce. And also, an unrebutted affidavit is the truth in commerce, okay? So I'm going to hang, stop you for a second. So what you're saying in, in just clear English for people who are head are going, oh my gosh, I don't understand this UCC stuff. If, mm -hmm. you're, if you put something forth and you file it in this area and no one comes back and says this is wrong or shows documentation how this is wrong or files something else or in, some, in any way, shape, or form in a provable way, rebuts that, in other words, re replies to what has been stated. If they're in the absence of anybody coming forth and saying, you're full of it, Heather Ann, to GRF, yeah. then in mm -hmm. the absence of that, it is so, because their silence has actually been their rebuttal to claim that it's so. Is that fair to say? Yeah, well, well the truth is unrebuttable. You know, commercial law is predicated on truth. Truth is the funda fundamental principle of, of commerce. And uh, <laughs> if, if, if uh, well, the thing about a UCC1 financing statement, let's say, is that, like, you know, you, 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 you give everybody due, co um, due and fair notice, okay? Uh, three times due and fair notice is a fundamental principle as well, if you like. You know, if you have a, if you believe you have a claim against somebody uh, um, uh, in commerce, uh, you would say, you'd write to them and say, well, look, you know, you owe me like 500 grand for that container I sent out to, pay, to Beijing, you know, and, uh, you know, you haven't paid me. So you wait and you see 21 days and no sign of any reply. So you do it again. And then you do it again the third time. Okay, and once you've done it the third time, and again we're into we're into fundamental, basic ideas that if you go if you dig down into them they're they're like solid principles, you know. Yes. Or I gave you three times due and fair notice. I mean I've done my due diligence. You know I've done my due diligence, and I haven't had a reply from you, and on that basis and at that particular moment, you have good cause to file. A UCC one financing statement against the collateral of that ind individual or entity or whatever it or uh, whatever it may be uh, for the purposes of um, obtaining due and fair remedy or at least this was the idea anyway I'm talking about an idea <laughs> that had been around for a long long time you know in a commercial system now. Right. We're talking about we're talking about a commercial system. And just so uh, to interject here, commercial system, the UCC. A lot of people, well, now they've heard of it. Before they hadn't. Um, mm. And the UCC is the it's the law of the land, inclusive. Actually, it's not just commerce. Actually, when you once you peel back the curtain, you'll see that it's the law of the land of of all. But it's the banker's law of the land, and and. That's how they operate. So they know full well. The court knows full well. That's why Heather is such a hot mama potato right this minute. <laughs> <laughs> and and um, whereas she's supposedly a guest of their est fine establishment, they don't want to touch her because of, just as we said, the, the claim has been perfected. It has not been rebutted. And they can't, at any way they turn, any order they issue, anything that comes out will actually reveal numerous layers and levels and expansive areas of fraud and deceit and duplicity. Mm -hmm. mm. uh, yeah, there is a lot. Um, the, the position 
the situation as it stands is um, is intense. You know, it's it's huge. It's huge. What's being said? What's being stated? Like, and what's being claimed? You know, by various people. Like, I mean, when I say people, <laughs> they're they're like they're, they're, You really have to have a. Uh, a clear understanding of what was filed and the claim that was made to be able to say something like, well, that's a foreclosed entity. They no longer exist. They don't have any power. They don't have any assets. Okay? And if they think they have assets, well, they're delinquent in their operation in commerce. Because I have a financing statement here that says you're a foreclosed entity. Yes, and I, I just want to put in, you can see right now, uh, going back to connecting the dots, Look around and you'll see lots of different headlines right now. I mean, you had mentioned uh, um, that John Kelly, uh, General John Kelly, is now taking command of the White House Chief of Staff. So that would be an. Well, I heard that from someone. I didn't. Uh, I didn't uh, <laughs> hear that quite described like that. I mean, I heard that General Kelly was in the East Wing, <laughs> whatever, well, no, whatever he, that is. He's now oh. the he's now the White House Chief of Staff for President Trump. So, well, I, I wish him very well, you know. But I mean, as far well. as a dot, that's important <laughs> because it it speaks to things that are going on behind the scenes. So, right. Okay. I mean, I haven't quite looked into that uh, because I've been focusing on other things. But you know, I, I, I'll look into that a little bit further and see what's behind that. Um. Yeah, which reminds me, actually. Um, and I would appreciate anybody who could possibly have an insight or a comment or anything about it. And uh, when I look at the warrant uh, that was issued for Heather's arrest, I see on the left hand side, top left hand corner, United States of America versus Heather and Tucci Giraffe. Okay? And. Most uh, there would be plenty of people out there who know that um, the way in which you write uh, the parties say to any particular cause of action uh, is 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 important. It, the, you know, in, in, under the rules of commerce, uh, different ways of uh, writing things denote different capacities and standings. Okay. So in, in the context of that warrant, what you have is United States of America, proper case. The proper case means that it has a capital at the beginning of the word, and the other words on the other letters of that word are lowercase. Okay? So we're talking proper case here. So what kind of a what kind of a vehicle is that? You know? Who is that? What is that? You know, normally when we look at cases that are listed on the Supreme Court website or the U.S. District Court website, uh, we find that in many cases uh, the uh, United States of America is, all, is described as all caps. The corporation. You know? <clears throat> well, capitis diminutio maxima, isn't it? All caps, the all caps name. Right. So, obviously... Or at least, you know, the the the, the law goes that when I say um, the law goes that there's a difference. There's a difference in the in the standing there of what kind of an entity that is. The all caps name is different to the proper caps name. Okay, so I don't know. I don't, I'm not going to speculate about what's going on there. Okay, but there's something because I have seen other supreme or other district court judgments and whereby, you know. The prosecuted or the prosecutor is United States of America, all caps. So something's going on there. Maybe General Kelly will be able to explain that to you. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> you know? But th there were plenty of people out there who might have a context of that, okay? Now, it could be any one of a number of things. It could be any one of a, num a number of things. But it's significant, I believe, anyway, at this particular juncture. It is. That I'll, warrant is issued like that. Yes, and I'll interject here that uh, on the uh, different phone conversations that Heather has 
had with us over the last couple of days, she has mentioned repeatedly that this is case, uh, let me just go here, um, it's a red herring, the case is a red herring. So what's a red herring, BZ? Can you explain that one to me? Yeah, well, the <laughs> definition that it, um, pulled up, something, especially a clue, that is or is intended to be misleading or distracting. So right. my sense, well, I have lots of senses on that, but my sense, given the context that I've had firsthand uh, interface with, is that you're mentioning here um, and calling to attention here how the warrant is issued in the proper cap um, is actually a very important dot, and we'll leave it at that for you all to put into place and start to connect. Right. However, you have to take it in the context of the entire warrant, okay? Mm-hmm. And at the, at the top of the warrant, you have what? U.S. District Court, Eastern District of Tennessee, isn't that correct? Yes. And is that U.S. District Court written in all caps? And does it have dots after the U.S. and all that kind of thing? Um, I haven't looked at it now for an hour or two. Let's see if we can dig it up here. <laughs> you hear all the clicking, that's... <laughs> <laughs> We're clicking away like an acting <laughs> eye. That's, uh, that's us <laughs> clicking all the different files we have here for all of this. Right. Okay, here it is here now. Okay. United States District Court. Well... Yep, go That's ahead. Not proper, it's, it's not proper case. It's not all caps. It seems to be all caps, but caps at the beginning of the words are larger caps than the caps in the rest of the world. So this is a whole new ball game altogether. I've never seen that before myself, but obviously it's, um, you know, it's common. That's how they do it, and that's the form they use, and so on and so forth. But it's interesting, you know, you start looking at these things, you know, you get an idea of kind of what's going on, you know, or you can discern sometimes uh, certain uh, statuses, if you like, of particular documents. But anyway, this is saying here, this warrant is saying that it has been, this is, this is, I'd say there's an, an extra stamp added here, a case number 117MJ531, assigned to Magistrate Judge Deborah A. Robinson. So, so that was probably added on to the warrant after it was received in court That's uh, correct. by the U.S. Marshal, who once, uh, once he had arrested Heather, approached the court then and gave it to the court, okay? Uh, under a certain rule, under a particular, in fact, under the Federal Rules of Criminal Procedure. And um, it also says it got a date assigned, okay? Date assigned. So the, he's effectively assigned it to the court right? under, the, under the Federal Rules of Criminal Procedure. It's got capacity, there is um, there's a rule there for that. And it says description, arrest warrant, rule 40. Okay, so you have to look at, according to the According to the U.S. District Court in, in, in Washington, D.C., this warrant is a warrant under Rule 40 of the Federal Rules of Criminal Procedure. Well, that is a slightly different warrant to a warrant issued under Rule 4. Okay? Um, so there may have been some confusion Okay, <laughs> and confusion, of course, is a psychotic condition, or at least uh, that's the what I'm told. I'm not an expert in anything, okay? I'm just a guy who, you know, observes the world around me and makes conclusions about it, you know, <laughs> and opinions, you know, and I don't really care what anybody else thinks of my opinion, you know, but if it helps you and you can get a context of what you what, what's going on uh, in relation to this particular case, anyway, well, uh, I'm 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 happy to help you. You know what I mean? Right. When I say help you, you I'm happy for you to help yourself in taking my opinion and doing what you like with it. There you go. <laughs> that, that, that's inc- that's correct context for that uh, statement, <laughs> Paul. <laughs> and you'll notice too. I'll I'll 
publish up the one that's the actual. It's a copy of the original one that Heather mm -hmm. in um, in her uh, DC detention housing circled the different parts uh, interesting on the warrant um, and yeah. and notice the corrections on the upper right hand corner. Um, Mr. Parker still uh, shows up in there, mm. and yeah. there's there's other points. But let's move on to um, where we are right this moment as far as things unfolding. Why is uh, we talked about um, unrebutted on the UCC filings? We talked about the totality of um, the documents, and the and the big thing was that these have have been filed um, in within the U United States District Court in Washington DC and the newest note from uh, newest information from Heather via phone conversation was that the um, the documents actually have been accepted and filed and that's from the official side not just from what was the um, the other filing outside? Well, aside okay, of like I would have a slightly different interpretation of what that note actually said. Okay, okay. What she's actually saying in that. Okay, now certainly the documents were entered. Okay, when I say entered, they were handed over. Okay, so the, so the U.S. District Court is in possession of them. Okay. Okay. Now whether they're filed or not is another matter. Okay. Well. When I say they're filed, there's a, there's, a, there's a district court stamp on them saying that they've been received, okay? But as far as I'm aware, there was, there was um, now I can't verify this because I didn't see the official source where it came from. It, came, it, just, it came from one of the team, one of our team. Okay. Directly from Heather. Yeah. While she no, was, no. While she was talking talk to her case manager. Okay, no, I'm talking about, uh, yeah. Okay, I see what you're saying, yes, right. So, in other words, there's an issue about the filing, okay? But um, I think that's a... The quote that's was... A, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a technicality, like, at the moment, you know what I mean? It's like, the, the fact of the matter is they're in possession of them, they were filed, and they were given to the public defender first, do you know what I mean? Right, and the note, uh, just to read here, Paul, the note from... Um, Lisa from directly from uh, Heather so Heather gave this directly to Lisa over the phone and yeah. she was speaking from um, her case manager's office at the time of this conversation right. that the court is now record holder of documents yeah I know yes that's what it says record holder so is that filed or unfiled or what is it you know, is it in compliance? You know, like uh, right. Uh, okay, so there's all kinds of things, but she's actually quite correct. You know what I mean? <laughs> they are in possession of those files. Right. So anyway, that's kind of an issue that for the court to to, to consider. They, I, I believe, uh, the judge has considered it and 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 and. Uh, um, had taken cognizance of it for want of a better word, okay, taken cognizance of it and stated out clearly that, yes, I'm aware, we're aware that the court is aware like, that certain documents were, were filed or uh, requested to be filed, you know, mm -hmm. and available uh, a space to um, for the public defendant to inspect those documents, because obviously he couldn't be, he couldn't... <laughs> He couldn't be. He couldn't carry on with his case, or or nothing could go ahead. Like uh, until he'd exp he'd inspected them to know what they were. Like I mean, to to make. Do you know? He had to, he had to be given the opportunity to inspect, you know, those documents. So, because he was made aware of it by the court, and he didn't know whether he had actually been served with those documents or what they were. So he had to go and check it out. Or right. She, the, you know, like the the court. Maybe allowed uh, the space, gave them space, you know what I mean, to, to inspect them, to verify that everything was on board and they were the documents that he was instructed to file. Right. So, 
without words. without mentioning too much specifics of the ongoing case, I know that you're you're reticent to, to speculate well, on that. That's fine. Yeah, I mean, like I can't verify uh, any order that was made, although some indication of an order uh, did appear. All right, but. Personally, I would like to see that from an official source, you know what I mean? Right. So what, I, what I'd what i like to see if we can do to, to wrap up this particular conversation is, um, given the original filings uh, and... When you, uh, when you say the original filings, now, which original filings do you actually mean? I mean prior to the factualized trust. You mean the UC, the, the One People's Public Trust that's, 1776 that's UCC filings? That's correct. Right. Okay. Go on. So in those being uh, not rebutted, and they stand uh -huh. as they are, and then the factualized yeah. trust w documents were created, yes. and that includes all of it. So that's one path. The way I'm looking at it to ask the question, that's one complete thought. Okay? Yeah. So mm -hmm. given, given that and the events that have unfolded with Randy and his um, access to his value, his actual funds and real money, regardless yeah. of the different stories. So, so that came out and then the factualized trust um, being the proof and documentation of the source of those funds. So all of mm -hmm. that to where we are right now, if you mm -hmm. can just give a very – brief snapshot of what does that actually mean for where Heather is with the position. So normally you, if you get arrested, they ask you who you are, they ask you all of their legal terms, which actually is getting you to contract all that. Heather has not done any of that, which is why it's been postponed these different times and there actually hasn't been any "Quote unquote meat of what's going on, and they, she, they have not uh -huh. shipped her off to Tennessee. Right. So if okay. you could just give a brief summary of why, what is the power that Heather holds in her, her filed documents that the judge is aware of that has stopped all of that from happening? Well. So far. Whatever, whatever about what the judge is aware of, I wouldn't like to speculate on that because that's for, for her to say uh, in the, at the appropriate moment, you know. Um, but what I do know is that um, the documents that have been filed, whether they be the UCC financing statement or the original due, notice, uh, due declaration and notice of factual based trust and the associated document, okay, that um, a particular um, position has all has been established, okay, which affects uh, it. It affects everything. It affects the warrant. Affects the indictment. It affects the court. It affects everything from Heather's point of view, okay. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm only saying that. You know, that's from from my, I mean, I pretty much know um, what that's all about. I've looked into it extensively over many years, you know, and I know the situation. I am <laughs> a factualized, an original factualized trust myself, mm -hmm. you know. Yes, as am okay, I. That's, that's, the way, that's the reality of it. And... Um, <clears throat> I would say that, you know, that happened uh, before. The, 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 the issuance of the original factualized trust happened before any of the carry-on that happened in Tennessee in relation to the indictment, in relation to Randall Keith Bean, and in relation to Heather, and anything else that, you know, the authorities uh, are looking into or looking into you know I you know what we know is the story as published okay so mm -hmm. we look at a, we look at the published document we, we gather a certain amount of, of information from that um, you sort it then into what can be verified and what's 
like not quite uh, obvious maybe but if you have a context that incorporates or <laughs> I don't like that word it's quite unfortunate but <laughs> it involves the entirety of the filings and like it, it go back to you might as well take it all the way back to now to the Declaration of Independence and the one people okay mm -hmm. the, that that what I was pointing out about the one people uh, in the Declaration of Independence 1776 if you take all that in context uh, you're getting into it's it's a huge amount of, 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 of data and context and you know truth and fact if you want to talk about facts do you know yes uh, so does like and I you know do sympathize with people who um, come along and they look at something and they see a certain series of facts and they make assumptions and presumptions based on those facts when they don't have a, a context and they you know the you know you Maybe maybe the the context was tried to be explained to them, but you know they said, "Ah, oh, yeah, <laughs> sure, yeah, yeah, yeah." <laughs> okay, and you get that a lot, you know, from most uh, many people out there would would have that kind of an experience, you know. Um, you know, the, the the authorities are looking at you with like as if you had ten heads on you or something, you know. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean you see. Uh, the facts are one thing and the law is another, you know. There's the law and then there's legalities. And there's lawful and legal and there are all kinds of contexts. Right. Which you can hold, which you can hold things, okay. But um, essentially, when you look at it all together, the... The, the premise or the basic, the, the, in fact, the perfected claim, perfected claim, if you think about the words perfected and claim, perfected means that you've been through the process, you've done your three times due and fair notice, you've filed your UCC1 financing, financing statement. Once you file that financing statement, it's perfected. It's a perfected claim. Okay? There's no dispute as to the facts. And if there is a dispute for the fact, I mean, I mean, you go back to the perpetuity, and I love that word, the perpetuity, because of its implications and how uh, the perpetual succession of the trust of creation comes down to us or comes to us uh, all. It was always there. From our, collect our collective self-interest or collective self-interest that's that's the perpetual succession of the trust of creation perpetual succession is a commercial term um it relates to generally speaking in a very general way now like people might disagree with me but um if a company becomes dissolved let's say okay and during the course of the life of that company uh, certain events took place, okay, like there was a contract or something like that. And after the company is dissolved, um, somebody comes along and they have a claim against that company in relation to a contract that was entered into while the company was live. Well, that person still has a cause of action. Perpetual succession. Just because the company is dissolved doesn't mean that there isn't a claim there. There isn't a claim that can can't be... Uh, you know, progressed. So, um, you know, perpetual succession we're talking about here, right? Perpetual, always, you know? Right. Always, always existing. Perpetual succession. You know, in other words, we succeeded it. It succeeds. If you have a director of a company, he steps down and somebody else steps in his place, that's succession. In a way. Do you know what I mean? I do, absolutely. All right. And, Does and, that make, yeah. and what comes to mind to me when you're saying that is that it's it's original, so source, the source of all that mm -hmm. is, directly mm -hmm. to each being, Paul being, Beezy being, Heather yeah. being, every every you out there, each individual you listening to this, and anyone mm -hmm. sitting next to you, every single one mm -hmm. of you, no one left out. Right. 
And so and and I will add here now because this is a big something that I feel strongly about, and I know absolutely Heather does. Every being who is perpetrating these acts upon Heather in in the the role of the court case, those beings on as us, well. On us all. On us all. <laughs> yes. These acts are being perpetrated on us all. And, you know, for example, you can start out with those people immediately close to her family. Right. And I think of the of the, of the, of the, of the trauma that's involved in that in itself, not to mention the, the rest of us who are uh, fairly uh, shocked and appalled at behavior, but um, I could see, can I just evolve that a little bit and just to say that, you know, when we talked about uh, somebody who looks at something, uh, he looks at a certain set of facts or she looks at a certain set of facts and they don't have complete context, they have a set of rules by which they must uh, comply, okay, and they have to do certain things, they have to do their job, so to speak, okay? Yes. Uh, I don't, you know, I very slow to vilify uh, such people, um, you know, in the, you know, like if, if you know, I, I, you know, I'm very cautious, like about about naming names or pointing fingers at anybody. This is a situation that has evolved, and uh, the reality is that it's been trying to come out. The truth of this has been trying to come out for a very long time, and now. Uh, this thing, uh, I had a friend, and I, I will name him, James J. Bailey, who I was involved with um, for quite a while, and we involved in the court case in Ireland. But um, one of the things that he used to say to me was that the truth is indestructible. Truth is indestructible, and of course, it, it's almost, in a way, it's like a mathematical certainty, right? Yes. Without truth, <laughs> what have we got? There, can, there, there, there's no, there isn't even an existence if truth does not exist. You know, there are some very deep subjects that you can go into and 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 and, and look into. You know, but um, for our purposes, uh, the situation is as it is, and there is a, an almighty context there, an almighty context. And there are people who know what that context is and on a very, very deep level. And we're talk I'm talking about bank trade and finance, if you, if you like. Absolutely. At the, at the end of the day, this boils down to uh, banking. Well, that's what that's what owns the you know the mechanism for owning and ruling the world. I think it's fair to say at this point too that for some people who look at all of these things that are happening, the various documents, particularly the factualized trust, and say, well, you know, what is that? There's some woo-woo stuff in there. Well, everybody draws their own conclusions, has their own perspectives, and that's absolutely great. All that comes through, and you'll see you'll see things unfold, and you'll see the the truth unravel. What I will say to that, though, is that the quote-unquote and purported woo-woo, make no mistake that the powers that hold um, the strings of the, the, uh, the construct, the fake construct that hold the strings within the courts, that hold the strings within all of this realm of... Uh, legality that we're talking about right now, they know very well exactly what all those words mean. And they know, know what's exact they know what's happening here. Absolutely. They know what's happening. When I say they <laughs> and they're, I say and they're, I say I have to say us because in a way they don't exist. That's but right. us we, we do exist. That's right. And they and, <laughs> and well and so us using that term there, Paul, us are very well briefed in what woo-woo is, in fact, uh, we, they are um, fluent in it. So yeah. so don't use that as a, I'm just suggesting that um, if that's your stand to brush something off, um, it would be helpful to to perhaps expand your stand on and your and your understanding of what that is. So let's wrap up here, Paul. It's, it's a very big... Uh, um, conversation, and this is just a little tiny piece of it. 
There is lots of information out there all over the Internet. The IUV is yeah. one place to give you information uh, to look at. And I, I, mean, I think it's important for people to tune in to <clears throat> the best, best expert that they have, which is themselves, to tune into their own um, discernment, their own resonance meter, and, and feel into not just using your head brain but the heart brain. Feel into mm-hmm. what actually is going on. And connect the dots. When you see things like Trump giving a speech and a quote uh, in the very short speech just yesterday, August 1st, that prosperity is coming perhaps like we have never seen before. That's a dot. When you see a headline, and some of these that I'm referring to are all on the IUB, when you see a headline, um, Money Magazine just published the IMF to launch new form of aid with no money. That's a dot that relates to the IMF and the Bank of mm-hmm. International Settlements being foreclosed on. They have no money, so they have to come up with a new form of aid that doesn't have money. Um, so all of these dots are connected. It's just a way for people to start to look at things in a broader context, in a broader yeah. perspective of what they knew, and you will see things light up for you all over the place. That's right. and. I think there are probably quite a number of people out there who um, are aware of the UCC one filing, or at least the UCC filings, <coughs> and obviously are aware of Heather and who she is. Okay, or at least what she, you know, what's what she's been involved in. Let's say, um, and they might have even seen the documents and looked through them and said. I don't have the faintest idea what this is all about. This is difficult for me now. It's difficult to understand it, you know. Uh, it's all written in commercial language, and, you know. Mm-hmm. But they have they have a sense, you see. It's I I get it that uh, a lot of people have a sense somewhere. They have something that's telling them that there's something here now, and you only have to read the documents and you. It does have an effect on you, like, even if you don't know anything about commercial law or UCC or UCC, Uniform Commercial Code in particular. Okay? Um, you just, just read the words and listen to the words and you get a sense of what's actually happening here, you know? Even if you don't know <clears throat> what a secure party is or what a debtor is. What debtor is. Right, because in reading those words and reading them out loud, you are setting up a toning mm. between the energy and the actual ink on the paper that you're mm. holding and reading, and the mm. voice, the resonance of your own voice, the own your own being reading that. Mm. And in the confluence of those two things, you are setting up the that knowing that's starting to come up with inside you that's knocking on on your awareness to to look here yeah i mean the truth is speaking to you like that's the reality of it <laughs> the truth is speaking to your heart and your heart is responding to it somewhere somehow something is telling you that there's something here and of course most people uh, these many people in the Western world, if you like, uh, are aware of uh, an excruciating situation in terms of finances and how uh, the system as it has evolved uh, has reduced oneself to <laughs> a state of um, something lesser than what you could possibly be. You know, restrictive in nature. Absolutely. Um, you know, and like we call a spade a spade, and it's written in documents in big black letters, like slavery systems. Okay, slavery systems, former and alleged slavery systems <laughs> that exist now, or at least they used to exist. They still think they exist, but that's not the case. I mean, you are you're not a slave anymore. Right, it's time to have that awareness. 2013. Do you know? Nobody but nobody but nobody has a claim against you if you're a living being. 
Nobody. I can prove it. <laughs> I can prove that no corporation has any claim against you or I. And I think that question is going to have to be answered now. The United States District Court. But that's not for me to say how that argument is going to evolve or, 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 or be argued, you know, let's say. Uh, the fact of the matter is, I mean, there's no doubt about the fact that, there's no doubt about the fact that the, the documents have been submitted. Those particular documents that are listed in the annex, the index of the annexes, they were given to the clerk with the intention that they be filed. That was the intention that was the specific will of Heather and Tucci Giraffe. Reference name, Heather and Tucci Giraffe. Proper case. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yes. So anyway, but that's, a, that's an issue that I, I, it's not for me to decide who is, or, or is going to argue what in relation to that. You know, that, that, that's, 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 that's the court's business. Great. Or, and it's Heather's business, you know, yes. so. I'd like to leave with one, this one thought for everybody. Um, don't worry so much about understanding all of the UCC, all of the legal documents, all of that. Tune into your own voice and do what you feel moved to do as far as getting information out, what you do understand, what you do feel, what you do know. And now is the time to understand within yourself that you are... Uh, a creator being, you are an original being, a live human being, not a slave, none of those things. And now is the time to do what you feel moved to do in certain ways to claim that, to stand up for that, to make a joyful noise about that. And as you watch and partake in all these things that are unfolding. Yeah. There's a document I can point you to, actually, that's... Um written in a way that you can easily understand and get a context of, you know. And it's the original disclosure announcement that was made in 2012. Do you have a copy? I, I mean, I'm sure I sent you a copy of it. Yes. No, I've got a copy. It's already on the, it's already on the IEV. I will pull it out yeah. separately and put yeah. it right with this, this yeah. recording. That's so. a beautiful description of, um, what, you know, the context of what has been done. Yeah. Okay. So we'll leave it at that. Thank you so much, Paul. We'll do another right. of these conversations, and we'll see what the what the wild ride unfolds for all of us. Thank you. Okay. You're welcome, Busy. <laughs> bye bye. All the best. Bye now. Okay, so that was a phone call with BZ and Paul McDonald. Now it was kind of a lot to take in. They go over a lot of information regarding Heather's case and the paperwork that's been filed. I actually had to watch this a few times to get a really good understanding of what exactly is going on. But if you guys have any questions, be sure to leave them in the comment section below, and I'll do my best to answer all of them. Um, as always, you guys have a wonderful night, and thank you very much for keeping up with this and following along. Bye-bye.